The best part about making this series is finding a game that manages to delight and surprise you by taking concepts you're already familiar with and then taking them in new directions. I'm sure there are others out there, but this was a first for me, a narrative driven 2D platformer that includes the player as part of the plot via fourth wall breaks. My name is Groudon and I'm reviewing Steam games in alphabetical order to find the hidden gems among the piles of garbage, and today's game is Klaus. Let's begin. Have you ever looked across a crowded room and locked eyes with someone stunningly gorgeous and found yourself at a loss for words? Well, that's me and Klaus. I've got a lot to talk about here, but sometimes you can have so much you want to say, it becomes difficult to say anything at all. So let's start at the beginning with some background on the game. Klaus might not seem like much initially. It's a gorgeously stylized 2D platformer, but that's not something unique. In fact, you could argue that this subgenre is already somewhat oversaturated. So how do you stand out in a market like this? Well, the developers of Klaus, Lacosa Entertainment, decided that storytelling through visuals and mechanical gameplay progression was the way to do it. Interestingly, Lacosa are a group of developers based out of Venezuela, and they actually won an excellence award in the Square Enix Latin contest in 2012. They released Klaus onto Steam, PS4 and Switch in 2019, and it's the only game they've released. This means that Klaus is the first game in the series that actually had a significant development team behind it, and you'll see that this is evident in the polish that has been put into the game. However, polish doesn't make a great game in and of itself, and Klaus was actually somewhat overlooked on release and only has 74 Steam reviews at the time of writing. Before we can dive into the gameplay proper, we need to take a look at the main menu and options. Firstly, resolution is correctly detected, but there are no graphical options, and this is okay. The game doesn't need it thanks to its simplistic art style, which allows it to run on virtually any machine built in the last 20 years. Separate music and sound effect sliders are always welcome, but the gold to be found is in the control section. Look at this. It's beautiful. Not only are all the keybinds shown, but they can also be rebound. I can't explain how happy it makes me to see a competent options menu. Klaus also has full controller support, and having tried playing with both a controller and keyboard and mouse, I would recommend using a controller for this game. I'll elaborate on exactly why when we get to the specific section, but for now, just trust me. Grab a controller, it will make everything feel much better. The game begins with Klaus awakening in the basement of a long abandoned office building with no memory of who he is or how he got there, other than the fact that he has the name Klaus tattooed on his arm. The first area acts as a tutorial, introducing the basic mechanics and the narrative device of text appearing outside the playable area that allows you to see into his mind, essentially reading his surface thoughts and emotions. The platforming controls for Klaus are a mix between excellent and questionable at times. For the most part, he controls as you would expect. You've got all the usual bags of tricks, including a double jump and the ability to sprint, and 99% of the time, the movement feels great. Unfortunately, there are some weird physics when conveyor belts are introduced in later stages, leading to some unwieldy movement. It's not game-breaking, but it can feel frustrating. The next mechanic that is introduced is the player's ability to interact with certain mechanical objects on screen, represented by the cog icon. And this is where Lacosa made the excellent decision to combine the gameplay and narrative elements together. Although we are controlling Klaus, he actually has a level of awareness of this, and comments on the fact that machinery appears to be moving as though controlled by an outside force. In fact, throughout the game, Klaus comes to acknowledge you, the player, and begins to participate in one-way conversations with you, sharing his thoughts, desires, and fears. And this is woven into the gameplay in some truly wonderful ways further into the game. For now, Klaus accepts our help, but doesn't seem to fully trust us. Even though we're guiding him to safety past several hazardous areas, a habit that will become all too familiar. We are also introduced to checkpoints, which function as you would expect. Should Klaus die, he will be respawned at the last checkpoint activated. The first level continues in this way, with Klaus even commenting that the spikes are rather dangerous and out of place in a basement. Each area ends at a set of doors, and each level consists of a set of areas that end at a door with an exit sign. The second area of the first level introduces Klaus's special ability, hacking. 
This allows him to activate or deactivate certain platforms and doors which follow a set path, which is similar but different to the controlled movement that the player can perform. It also introduces the first of many secret areas. These zones contain bright flashing lights in their intros and outros that may be uncomfortable for some viewers, and these cannot be disabled in the settings, something which I do think is a bit of an oversight. These areas shake up the art style, swapping out the detailed backgrounds of characters for simple colours and silhouettes, and each secret area also introduces introduces a unique mechanic. In the case of the first one, Klaus is only able to move to the left, meaning you'll need to rely on different methods to move Klaus to the right. This does a great job of shaking up the usual platforming formula, while also giving you a reason to look forward to these areas to see what the next unique twist is. Your reward for beating these areas are memory fragments. Collecting all fragments within a world will unlock a memory for you to play through, which provides you with the backstory of who Klaus is, what this mysterious building is for, and provides welcome motivation for the player. These secret areas aren't too challenging to find. If you're paying attention, you'll likely collect them all on your first playthrough. In fact, you'll need to collect them all if you want to see the game's true ending, but more on that later. Having finished the secret area, we guide Klaus to the next door and discover a new type of recurring area. This requires the player to manipulate the environment to guide the key to Klaus rather than guiding Klaus to the key. These puzzles remind me of those awful mobile game ads, you know the ones I'm talking about, with the pins that need to be pulled to reach the treasure, except these are actually engaging and fun. With the key acquired, Klaus can now head through the exit door to finish the first level. The game consists of six worlds, each with around six levels in each, and each level made up of two to three areas. So there's a decent amount of content to be found here. It took me around six hours to complete the game, which can be a substantial amount of time for a 2D platformer. Thankfully, Klaus is able to keep the player engaged due to its drip feed of new mechanics and narrative. I won't go into too much detail, as I don't want to spoil the story and surprises for anyone considering picking up the game. As an overview though, here are some of the mechanics introduced, starting with the most important. Please say hello to K1. K1 is, well, the best way I can describe him is as a human golden retriever. Incredibly well-meaning, but not the brightest spark. K1 is actually the first boss fight, but Klaus actually befriends him after this encounter. This leads to the player being able to control both Klaus and K1 in what appears to be a nod to the Lost Vikings, an excellent 2D platformer for the Super Nintendo made by Blizzard back when they were a respectable company. You can switch between Klaus and K1 with a button press, or you can hold down a button to move them both together. On a controller, this is bound to the left trigger, but on keyboard, this is set to left control, which results in some awkward hand placement as you'll need to hold both control, shift, and movement keys all at the same time. This is one of the main reasons I recommend playing Klaus with a controller. K1 comes with his own unique set of mechanics, such as being able to punch enemies and certain objects out of the way, glide using his torn up shirt as a parachute, and even perform a Street Fighter style uppercut that functions as a double jump, and it's used in some creative platforming ways. Visually, the similarities between Klaus and K1 are obvious. The black pants, red tie, and yellow shirt are present, but torn due to K1's massive size, implying that he didn't all always look like this. We're told little else about K1, but we do gradually learn more about his origins and his connection to Klaus as the game progresses. With both characters available to us, they need to work together to proceed through each area, usually involving them parting ways temporarily to open routes for each other before meeting up again at the exit. As the levels proceed, the new mechanics that are added include K1 being able to throw Klaus up to higher areas, bouncy springs, powerful fans, acid jets, electrified walls for wall jumping, laser beams, and much more. At one point, Klaus becomes fed up with being controlled by the player, and in an attempt to regain some semblance of control over his life, defies the player by walking on their own, leaving you to use the environment to guide him safely to the exit. In another example, Klaus actively rebels against the player by reversing the controls for a series of levels. This is a fantastic way of blending game design into the narrative, as it helps the player to more closely understand his frustration at his lack of free will. One other thing I'll mention is that the level design itself is impeccable. It's always clear where you need to go, and rarely are you left scratching your head for too long. At one point during the livestream, I had just finished a secret area, and upon returning, I used a key that Klaus was carrying in the wrong place, effectively going backwards instead of forwards. There was one here, yeah. 
Oh, I think I just broke the game. I actually think I just broke the game because I went backwards. I haven't got a key anymore. So unless there's another key up there, I have actually just broken this. I was worried that I had soft locks for myself. However, with a bit of backtracking, another key was found, enabling me to proceed without resetting the level. Each area also plays to the strengths of both Klaus and K1, emphasizing their differences, but also how vital it is for them to work together. Now, as usual with these story-focused games, if you're considering picking this up, I'd recommend skipping ahead to the verdict. There is a time code on screen for you. If you're still here, I'm going to assume you're okay with some spoilers. As the game has been progressing, each world ends with an elevator ride up to the next area. Eventually, you'll reach the top of the building, where Klaus is able to head outside for the first time, basking in the light of the afternoon sunset and into the evening as he continues to climb. Upon reaching the top, you'll discover a computer terminal simply labelled LIFE. Hacking this causes the world to shift and also unlocks arcade mode, allowing you to pick and choose levels to replay freely. This is necessary because if you've reached this point without collecting all the memory fragments in the secret levels, Klaus will have no option but to throw himself off the building, plummeting all the way back down to the basement where the game began and losing his memories in the process. On the other hand, if you have collected all the memories, you'll have access to a platform that raises you up to a hidden area, the office where your father resides. After a brief discussion where he compliments both Klaus and the player on their performance, Klaus's father offers him a choice. He wants Klaus to replace him because he is actually the original Klaus, and the Klaus we have known has been put through a series of trials as means of an assessment to see if he is a worthy replacement. Klaus rejects his father's offer as he would rather go and explore the world, as he's already sick of following instructions and wants to have his own free will, and this forces a fight between the two, as Klaus's father cannot allow the secret of the company to get out. While the final boss fight should be the peak of the entire game, unfortunately all three boss fights are the weakest parts, especially this one. The mechanics are all either incredibly easy to dodge, or outright unfair as they don't telegraph the attack particularly well. This means that it comes down to memorising the movements and dodging accordingly. Annoyingly, you can also easily softlock yourself here. There are terminals on the left and right sides of the screen that Klaus needs to hack. If you break both of the walls before hacking the first terminal, the second terminal will become inaccessible until you have reset the fight completely. In a somewhat anticlimactic finish, the mech goes down after two hits. Having lost the fight, Klaus's father attempts to crush Klaus in a last ditch effort, which is thwarted by the timely arrival of K1. The three of them agree to a truce, as none of them really wanted to fight anyway, Klaus just wants to take his chance at freedom and explore the world. K1 decides to remain behind, knowing that he won't fit in with society, and instead opts to assist Klaus one last time, by launching him up and out of the tower. In the final, touching moments, Klaus thanks the player, acknowledging that without our help, he wouldn't have been able to realise his true dream. Klaus is an excellent experience that I can best describe as a roller coaster, complete with both the ups and downs. At its peaks, it's an innovative combination of genres with outstanding level design, excellent music and sound effects, and an amazing art style to match. At its lowest, it causes frustration with imprecise controls in some sections, and a feeling that a bit more love could have been given to some key moments. Overall though, the highs outnumber the lows, and I enjoyed the entire 6 hour experience. There's also some replayability here thanks to the unlockable arcade mode that encourages you to speedrun the levels. Other than polishing some of the aforementioned sections, there's not a lot that I would suggest changing about the game. It's fantastic as it is. Games like this are the hidden gems that I love to discover and shine a spotlight on, flaws and all. At 1749 Canadian, or your regional equivalent, you'll certainly get your money's worth here. It's an experience you could play through in an afternoon, but you'll remember for quite some time afterwards. So, with all of that in mind, my final rating for Klaus is K1 out of 10. He's a bit rough around the edges, but has a kind and caring heart, and you can't help but want to protect him. K1 is the best. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the end of the video. A massive thank you to the channel members you see on screen, and a special shout out to the very first knight of the Holy Grail, Freaky Feline. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so for as little as a dollar per month. 
Just click the join button to see the available membership levels and perks. For a complete list of games covered so far and their ratings, check the description section for a link to a spreadsheet covering all of this and more, as well as a link to our new Discord community. Thank you for joining me on this weird gaming adventure through the depths of Steam, and until next time, take care.